How's everybody doing? We are really glad that you're here with us. So uh, let me ask you a question as we get going. How many of you are morning people? Okay, and how many, who are my night owls? Yeah, I figured that. A lot of you guys got out of bed like 15 minutes ago. So it was the reverse at 9.30. So just to give you an idea. Um, what's funny is it was all morning people at 9.30. 11 a.m. was almost a perfect mix. And there's like four people who got out of bed before noon in this service. So that's, anyway, and that's good. That's good. So uh, that's why this is the most lively service, because you guys are super awake, so, which I appreciate. So, but I will say this, that my son Xander has been a morning person since birth. And uh, when he was little, I mean like four, five, six years old, he would get out of bed and um, he would be the first one up at 545. The way I know it was 545 is because he would wake me up at 546 uh, to let me know that he was up. <clears throat> and so when um, one day Xander wakes up, you know, 545 in the morning, and he comes into my room, and uh, what he would usually do is just like start shaking me until I woke up, and that, that, and I'm like, uh-huh. And so then I'd say, what's up, buddy? And um, typically, be, hey, I just want to let you know I'm awake. But this day he had a question. Uh, I wake up, you know, shake him, he's like, dad, I'm like, yeah. And he's like, hey, um, my, now, he didn't know I had gone to sleep. I had a book deadline. So I'd gone to sleep after 2 a.m. And um, it was only, like I said, 545. And so he says, hey, um, which is the seventh fret on the guitar? And so I'm like, and my eyes are still closed. And I'm like, buddy, you know, like um, 3, 5, and 7 have the dots. 9 has a dot. 12 has two dots. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay. And then I said that, um, and then I, I, I thought, hold on, why is he asking me this question? And then I open my eyes and I see Xander with an acoustic guitar strapped on and he's like seven, he's like, and then he's like, okay, let's do this. And he's like ready to come down. And I'm like, no, dude. And I grab it and I'm like, dude, you can't start playing guitar at 5.30 in the morning. Um, everybody's asleep. And um, you know, what's funny is now he's a teenager and he likes to sleep in sometimes. And so I'm the guy walking around before 6 a.m. like an idiot, uh, and I'm the only one awake in my house. So, but uh, just to, um, but here's the thing that would happen is that, because he is the consummate morning person, because, you know, there's some people, you know, like, you know, like if you're married and you're like, do you wake up grumpy? And you're like, no, I just let them sleep till they're ready to wake up. And uh, really nothing for that, huh? <laughs> That's hilarious. Anyway, when you guys wake up a little bit, you'll get that joke. Um, but anyway, my son is not, he wakes up really happy. He's not a complainer. In fact, um, I told him this the other day, and I'm like, I, I realize this. You are almost 15 years old, and I've never heard you complain, ever. I complain more than he does. We were out the other day, and I was complaining about something. And he's like, Dad, relax. Everything's fine. And I'm like, all right, man, I'm good. I'm good. I promise. So anyway, um, but what, something would happen. Because he would wake up so early, after like 7 p.m., I mean, he, he, he would make a turn sometimes, and he would just, this ultra-positive kid would start going negative about the most basic things in life. And so one night in particular, um, we were, I told the kids, hey, if you guys get ready for bed, we'll watch the series finale of Star Wars Rebels, which if you've never seen Star Wars Rebels, it's the best thing Lucasfilm has done outside of the six George Lucas movies, which there's... I know they've made other films. There's six George Lucas movies, and that's it. Just ignore everything else. Um, and then Rebels, and you got all the good stuff. Anyway, but Xander was taking a little bit longer to get ready. And I'm like, hey, buddy, come on. Don't you want to watch the show? And, man, he was just like, it's never going to work out. I'll never make it in time. I shouldn't even be part of this family. And I'm like, whoa, this took a turn. This went dark quick. And, uh, and I'm like, dude, what's happening, man? Don't be negative. Be positive. And he's like, you're right, Dan. I'm positive it's never going to work out. And I'm like, okay, that's not what I meant. Now, uh, <laughs> every time I read this section of Exodus, I, I, I'm reminded of that conversation that 40 years on the backside of the desert has Moses believing that he's totally finished. And when God even appears to him in chapter 3, when we get in the burning bush, and he gets this call to ministry, hey, you thought you had failed, but I'm going to use you. This, things are going to happen. And to do the thing that was in his heart, which was to free God's people from Egypt, he still doesn't think he can do it. And God promises that he's going to be with them, and it's still not enough. And, and I want to tell you something. There's a lot that we're going to talk about today. But one of the things that I think is vitally important is that you to understand 
that God is for you. Now, it doesn't mean God agrees with you in everything, but it does mean that ultimately he is for you and wants to prepare you for the things that he's calling you to do. And we're going to see God give Moses everything he needs to do what he is being called to do. And guess what? The same thing is true for you and for me. God hasn't left him on his own. God hasn't left us on our own. Instead, he's equipping us, he's preparing us, he's opening doors for us, and he's going to be with us. And when you start believing that, it'll change how you walk. And when you start believing it and it changes how you walk, you are going to start seeing around you the doors and the things that God has been doing to help you accomplish the thing that he's put in your heart. So we're going to start in Exodus chapter 4, which, (coughs) if you remember, we're dropping into the middle of a conversation that started at the beginning of chapter 3. But it says this. It says, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me, nor listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What's in your hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, and that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put, in your, uh, <clears throat> put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. When he took it out, behold, it was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. And we put his hand in his bosom again. He drew it out of his bosom, and behold, it was restored like his other flesh. And then it will be, if they do not believe you nor heed to the message of the first sign, that they they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the Nile, put it up and pour it on the dry ground. The water which you take from the river will become blood, on the dry land. If you pause there and give me your attention. First thing, three things we're going to talk about about how God prepares us. But the first is this, if you're a note taker, is that God will give you the tools to succeed. Now, if you were with us last week, if you weren't, that's okay, I forgive you. Uh, but if you, weren't, if you were here with us last week, then you know that God to promise to be with Moses. And um, as he went to Egypt, and Moses' response is, this will never work. Why does he think that? Because that's what happened last time. He thought he was going to deliver the people of Israel, and they didn't believe, which is why he opens with this, like, what if they don't believe me? Because that's what he thinks is going to happen, that they're not going to believe him. And he thought that he was going to deliver the people of Israel. And so he says, but it's going to be different this time. God's saying, I'm going to be with you. And he gives, God gives Moses two signs to perform. One is turning a a staff into a snake, which, of course, we'll see later. And the other one is really interesting where Moses puts his hand in his chest that is under his cloak and he pulls out his hand and it's totally leprous. Then he puts his hand in again and it comes out and it's, and it's clean. Now, here's the thing you got to understand. Now, there's a couple things. One is most Bible scholars agree that the term leprosy didn't mean just leprosy, but it was in some ways kind of a catch-all term for um, any type of serious skin disease that was happening in a person in, in, in the ancient world. Now, Um, But let me tell you this. If you got leprosy in the ancient world, it was a death sentence. Your life as you knew it was over. Um, The first thing that would happen when you lost, uh, when you had leprosy is that you would lose contact with all people. You were kicked out of your home, kicked out of your community. You couldn't even live in the city. You had to live outside of the city walls, which was basically where all the garbage was dumped. And then anytime someone would approach you, you would start yelling, unclean, 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 until the person heard you and they went in another direction. You couldn't stand upwind from someone because if you had leprosy, you had to say that, you had to move out of the way so that the, when the wind was moving down from you, it didn't hit people that didn't, were not infected with leprosy. And so it was, it was a death sentence. Now, So understand, there's three signs that God gives Moses. Why? And he's trying to reveal something, not just to Moses, but to the people of Israel. The staff becomes a snake. Why? Because God is showing that he has power over life. The hand becomes leprous and becomes clean. God is showing he has power over death. And then the water turns to blood, which, of course, we're going to see in much greater fashion later in Exodus. Why? God is showing that he has power over the Egyptian gods. Now, 
What's amazing to me is that all this starts because he says, Moses, he said, well, what if they don't believe me? And he says, well, what's in your hand? And what I love, and he says, well, a staff. I love that God has been using that um, throughout the ages, right? All of the people that he has done great things with, he's simply just asked, what's in your hand? David, what's in your hand? I've got a sling and five smooth stones. Well, that should be enough to kill a giant. To a little kid, he said, what's in your hand? I got five dinner rolls and two sardines. And well, that should be enough to feed 5,000 people if Jesus is involved. And with Moses, it's a staff in his hand, and that should be enough. Now, let me tell you something that happens. Sometimes we think that if God is going to use us, that he's got to turn us into completely different people for us so that he can use us. And that's not the way that it works. God instead wants to transform you into a godly version of you but you're still going to be you, right? You're still going to look like you, and that's good news or bad news, depending on what you look like. Um, You're still going to sound like you, um, but there's going to be a work that God does within you that transforms you into the godly version of you that God can use. Now, some of you know my story if you've been around Calvary for a while, but I was not a great student in school, Um, and it wasn't the whole time. It was basically like first through 12th was when I didn't do well, and um, but... (laughs) But what happens is, and, and so, yeah, it took me five years, uh, well, four and a half years to graduate high school. As I tell people, being a senior was the best two years of my life. And, um, but I remember when I had it in my heart to start writing books. And um, I have a friend um, who's an author, and um, I had spoken at this event. He introduced me to a publisher, and, um, and they said, hey, why don't you submit a book proposal that's not really how they do it. You've got to have like an agent or whatever. But because they knew me, they're like, hey, just submit a book proposal. So I said, okay. So I submitted a book proposal for uh, this book I wanted to write, and, um, and they rejected it. But then something interesting happened. And that is not just that they reject it, but then they called me, which, by the way, is unheard of. They never do that. But they called me, and the acquisitions editor at the publisher said, Bob, we really like you, and, um, but you're just not ready. And they said, so here's what we want you to do. Read these three books and then come back with a different book proposal. And so, um, and I, I went back to that book, Good Night. That, was a, th- that book proposal was a disaster. I, I'm not even sure if it was English um, at, because I was a grammatical disaster. So they had me read three books and because everybody has asked me what those three books are, I'm gonna tell you what the three books are. The first was a book called The Elements of Style, which is a pretty famous book on, on writing. And um, because I had never read a book until I became a Christian, I had never read that book. The only book I'd read um, before uh, before becoming a Christian was a biography on the life of Madonna. And um, I know you've never pegged me for being a material girl, and yet here we are. So, um, which by the way, that was even kind of a chance thing. I went into a bookstore. If you remember Walden Books in the mall, I went into a Walden Books uh, because every month I I would get this magazine called Guitar World. So I was in there to get the new issue of Guitar World because in there they would have, this is like before the internet and electricity and all that, but they would have transcriptions of guitar solos. And so I went in there to get a transcription of a song. Um, And so, but, and then, but they didn't have it. But as I was walking by, I saw this end cap and it had all these, um, this, these paperback copies of this book. It was like the, the unauthorized whatever. So it wasn't an autobiography. It was a biography on Madonna's life. And I don't know why. I'm like, she's probably lived an interesting life. So I grabbed the book and I bought it. And they were like, it was $4.95, $5.25, including tax. And I'm like, what a ripoff. Five bucks for a book. What a, you know, anyway, I couldn't believe they were charging me five bucks. It took me six months to read that book. But now I know basically everything about Madonna or at least from 1992 back, I know everything about her. A- anything else, I don't know anything. But anyway, so they had, me read, um, they had me read The Elements of Style. The other was a book called Writing Tools, which is probably my favorite book ever on the subject of writing. Um, but they had an entire, they're short chapters, but they had an entire chapter on the use of an exclamation point. Um, and here's, I'm gonna tell you what it's about, so you don't even have to read it. So that chapter, he says you should act like you've only been given 10 exclamation points in your entire life to use. That's how rare you should use them. And I was like, man, that's so powerful. I would have hit that with an exclamation point right at the end. And it's like, you've missed the whole point of what the guy was talking about. And, um, but that's a great book. And then the third one um, was Brutal. And it's a book that I've talked about in the past called The Glamour of Grammar. And um, I saw writing tools at Barnes and Noble. I was with my kids. I'm like, hey, this is one of the books that this guy from Baker Books told me to read. Um, and then they didn't have the glamour of grammar, but um, that chapter was not short. 
uh, that book was not short, the chapter, I mean, this was like 25 pages on the subject of the proper use of a semicolon. And I'm telling you, I'm reading that, and I'm like, why didn't I pay attention in high school? And um, I just, I missed, I failed all four years of high school, um, all four years of English in high school, except the second half of English four. I was dating this girl, and she did all my homework for me. Best part of our relationship. Anyway, thank you very much. It's not going to work out. And uh, anyway, um, but that was, I had never used a semicolon ever. And I'm like, the semicolon, it's like it wants to be a comma. It wants to be a colon. It really can't commit to its place in life. And um, then, um, and you know, it's funny because um, I turned in, for my PhD, I turned in like 10,000 words yesterday. And um, I was semicoloning that whole thing. Uh, like I had semicolons everywhere. I'm like, how far we've come, you know? And, uh, and so I almost hit an exclamation point with that at the end. And, uh, but you know, fast forward, fast forward. Listen, I've written nine books. That little book begin that we give out, that thing is like in its seventh or eighth printing. I mean, and I get messages from people um, all over the world um, that, who have read it. I got a message like two weeks ago from a, um, a girl. I think she was in Pennsylvania or Ohio, one of those Rust Belt states. And, um, and she said, I started going to this church and I just gave my life to Jesus. And um, the pastor handed me a copy of your book. And I just wanted to reach out and tell you um, how much the book has really helped me in my first few steps and, and walking with God. Man, I was like, I, you could, I was so happy. I responded, and I'm like, hey, thank you so much. Um, you'd be amazed. This was written by a semi-illiterate person. Um, and so, now, and, and listen, the point is, it's like, what's in your hand? And what if God wants to use, think about this. You have natural gifts. That is, there's things that you're just naturally good at, talents. And then there's spiritual gifts that God wants to give you on top of that. And if you can take the thing that you're passionate about, the things that you're good at, and the spiritual gifts that God wants to give you, and you can create some synergy between those two things, um, God will use that in your life and just use the transformed version of you to change the world. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says this, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. See, Paul is saying this. He's like, if you were foolish when God called you, that's okay. God calls foolish people, and they're wise enough to hear. But the cool thing is this, is that even if you were foolish when God called you, that doesn't mean you have to stay foolish. God can actually transform your mind and make you wise. And um, I had this experience a few years ago. I became a Christian like 30 years ago, uh, almost 31. And, um, but I had, uh, I got, I, a friend of mine reached out to me that I hadn't talked to in years. And so um, it had been probably more than 20 years um, since we, we had spoken. And um, it was right around the time that I became five minutes on the phone. He says, Bob, you sound so much smarter than the last time we spoke, which is kind of a weird compliment, by the way, just between us. And, um, and I'm like, so, so I, I just, because I can't help myself. And I'm like, so does that mean I was an idiot before? And he's like, well, you know. Uh, um, and, he's, and then he just went, hey, I heard you have kids now. How are they doing? And I'm like, this guy was avoiding the topic. And I'm like, wow, Jesus not only saved me, but he saved me from being an idiot. Um, listen, here's what Moses learned, and here's what we can learn as well, is that when you give God what's in your hand, he will fulfill the plans that he's put in your heart. Now, he goes on in verse 10. And it says this, it says, Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. But he said, O oh Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Basically what he's saying is, Lord, no thank you. Just send somebody else. It says, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he's coming to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people. And he himself shall be a mouth for you. And you shall be to him as God. That is telling him what to say. And you shall take this rod in your hand. 
with which you shall do the signs. If you pause there and give me your attention. Um, the first thing we said was that uh, if God prepares you, he gives you the right tools. He gives you the tools to succeed. Second thing is, is that God brings you the right people. Now we're going to talk about Moses' brother Aaron um, in a little bit, but, and definitely as we go forward in the study. But I want to talk about Moses' next excuse, because I think that's important when he says, I'm not a good speaker. Now, uh, Bible teachers tend to go in one of two directions with explaining this, and um, I'm going to give you a third direction, which interestingly enough happens to be the correct direction that we go in. So, now, but I'll tell you what typically Bible teachers say. They'll say, number one, Moses actually wasn't a good speaker, and he's just like, God, you know I'm not a good speaker. Um, there's, some people say that he had like some kind of stuttering problem or whatever. Um, we know that's not true for two reasons. One, in the book of Acts chapter 7, in Stephen's amazing sermon, he says in verse 22 that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And even if you don't like Stephen's assessment, the other case that we would bring up is the entire book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy consists of three sermons. This is, the, this is Moses' final addresses before he dies. And so he addresses all the, the community of Israel, and he shares three sermons before his death. Deuteronomy is a masterpiece. So Moses was a great speaker. The second thing you'll hear sometimes people say is, well, Moses was lying. Yeah, that's not it either. The thing you have to, to really understand why Moses is saying this, you have to look into the ancient Near East culture to find the answer. In the ancient world, in the ancient Near East, there was this thing that was called extreme humility, where you would say self-deprecating things as an act of humility. So I'll give you an example. When Saul is chosen by, uh, to become king of Israel, here's what he says about himself. I put it in your notes. Saul answered, but am I not a Benjamite? the smallest tribe of Israel. That's true, by the way. They were the smallest tribe. But look what he says. And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? So what he's saying is, it's the smallest tribe, the small, I am the least person in all of Israel. How am I going to be the most important person in Israel? Um, that's not true. His family was a very prominent family in the tribe of Benjamin. But he says that, why? Because it's this practice of extreme humility. Um, my favorite one is when uh, Solomon is crowned king. Um, here's his prayer. He says, you have made your servant king instead of my father David. I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. I mean, he makes it sound like he's in the second grade and he's like writing his prayer in crayon. Um, like he wasn't a toddler. This dude was 40 years old when he became king. So I don't know. Like, I'm just a little child. Like, no, man, you've got like a beard and leg hair. Uh, we're way past that, okay? Um, and so anyway, and so the point is, is that um, this, so Moses saying this was just this practice, even though he was an eloquent speaker, it is this practice of extreme humility. Now, while this was a cultural issue, I do think it's important because sometimes we don't know how to properly estimate our gifts. Sometimes we don't even realize what our gifts are, sometimes because we're looking at somebody else's gifts and saying, well, I wish that was my gift. Um, and this is an important practice for us to have and an important skill. The Apostle Paul, in writing the book of Romans, says, it's in your notes, he says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now, the thing you have to understand is, when he talks about sober judgment, um, the Greeks did not have a word for humility. Instead, in the book of Philippians, Paul has to actually take two other words and make this compound word to have humility the way we understand it. The Greeks had a word for humility, but it meant passivity and weakness, and that's not what we're talking about when we talk about humility. The, the teaching that Paul is giving is totally countercultural, but it's vital for us. Humility doesn't come naturally to most of us, and here's why. Because you are always on your mind. And, um, and the next time you don't think that's true, find a group photo that you're in, and check out who you look for first. In fact, there could be 20 people in the picture. And if you don't look good in the picture, you're like, this picture is trash. Even if all the other 19, like 95% of the people look good, but that's trash because you don't look good. And I had this happen. Um, I, I wanted to post a picture of my family on Mother's Day, which in our house, I have to like get some my approval from my wife. Are you okay if I post this one? And so I'm like, hey, I found a picture. I'm going to post this. And, and I'm like, this one is great. And she's like, Bob, my eyes are closed. 
She's like, I'm not even looking at the camera. And I'm like, really? I'm like, I just thought I looked great and you guys were also in it too. And um, I hadn't even noticed that you weren't looking at the camera. And, um, but I'm telling you, this is just what we do, right? And this is the challenge that all of us have. When he says, having a sober estimation of yourself, the only way that you're gonna be able to make real decisions in your life about your future um, is really understanding what your talents and gifts and skills are. And that means having a sober estimation, not thinking too highly of yourself, not thinking too little of yourself. Thinking too highly of yourself is pride. Thinking too low of yourself isn't humility, by the way. Sometimes we think that, like we'll, think, we'll, we'll say things um, that we think is like, oh, I'll just say that I'm not good at anything because that sounds spiritual. It's not. Sometimes people are like, I'm not good at anything. You know, and it's like, that's not, um, that's not, like putting yourself down is not like you're just, you're just fishing for a compliment, um, which is basically pride in a different form. Now, one of the things that people will ask me, so I'll get this, they'll say, Pastor Bob, um, I heard that you play guitar. I'm like, yeah, I've been playing guitar since I was 15. Like, wow, that's a long time. Are you any good? Um, and I'm like, okay, that's a weird question to ask. But, uh, and so I'll say like, well, I'm not Hendrix, but I got some game. And, uh, and, and so, but you know, you can imagine like, you know, I'm not any good at all. You know, it's like, dude, you've been playing for like, what, 30 years? You better have learned to play something. And, um, but the thing that happens is, is that um, we've got to know, we've got to be able to look at ourselves objectively and say, these are what my skills are. This is what God has blessed me with. And this is what I have to work with. And I'm going to make decisions based on these are my natural giftings, these are my talents, these are my spiritual gifts, and I'm going to maximize whatever it is that I've been given. The parable of the talents that Jesus tells, that's really what it's all about. Is that what are you going to take, what, are you going to maximize that which God has given you? Um, here's the definition that I've, uh, when we talk about pride and humility, these are terms that get um, used a lot. Um, and so let me explain what humility is. By the way, it's humility, not humbleness. That's an important thing. Humbleness is not a word. Um, humility is a word. So I say that in all humbleness to you. But uh, no, I say that in all humility. I tell my kids that, like, never use humbleness in my presence um, because it's not a word. And so anyway, and if you do that, you'll keep getting gooder and gooder. And uh, so anyway, um, so here's my definition. <laughs> ah. Doesn't sound, that just sounds like something you should say when you're in West Virginia, right? I'm getting gooder and gooder here. And uh, if your best friend is Mater. Um, so, all right, I got to rail it in. It's getting away from me. Um, so here's my definition of humility. And that is humility is knowing who I am in light of who God is. Knowing who I am in light of who God is. Here's the definition that I've used for years of pride. Pride is making more of myself by making light of who God is. So that's why humility, knowing who I am in light of who God is. Pride, making more of myself by making light of who God is. Sober judgment is when I say I know who I am and I know how God has wired me. Um, I have things in my garage that, um, some stuff in my house that I gotta do that all involve electrical work. And I have made this decision that I will not do electrical work again. Um, because the last time I did electrical work, I almost burned my house down. And um, I called my brother-in-law, Jim, is, a, uh, is an electrician, and I called him one day, and I'm like, hey, uh, I, have, I have an electrical question for you. He's like, yeah. And I said, okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, how bad is it that sparks are coming out of my electrical panel? And he's like, out of 1 to 10, that's like right around a 20, and uh, I'll be right there. And, um, and I've just, you just got to realize, l listen, humility is recognizing what you're good at and what you're not. And it takes humility to say, I'm not good at everything. The truth of the matter is most of us are only good at like four or five things. So, the, you know, and I know that everybody has people in their life that they're like, this guy's just good at everything. No, they're good at like five things. Those just happen to be the only things that they do. That's why you've never seen me play the trombone, right? Can't do it. You've never seen me perform surgery. Can't do it. Ask the first guy I performed surgery on. Well, he can't tell you because he's gone. And so, but anyway, now, um, it just takes humility to recognize you're not good at something Proud people think they're good at everything and that, oh, not only can I do that, I can do it better than the other guy. Like, that's just, listen, God doesn't create people gifted in everything because we are a body, the body of Christ. And if you read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, it is an exposition on how we all need each other because I have gifts that you don't have, you have gifts that I don't have, and together using our gifts, we minister to one another and we grow together. So, what if you're in the place where you say, Pastor, that's awesome, but I still don't know what I'm good at? 
So let me give you a couple of questions to ask yourself. All right, here's one. Number one is, do you know what you're good at? Like, are there any natural gifts? And you say, I know I'm good at this. And by the way, that is besides like video games or I'm really good at texting. I mean, like beyond stuff like that. All right. Um, I can meme with the best of them. Like, all right, beyond stuff like that. All right. But here's another question to ask. Um, what do people say I'm good at? Um, that's an important thing to consider. Now, um, everybody has this. We all have people who call us asking for help. When people call asking for help, what kind of help are they asking for? That's another thing. Um, now, let me ask you this. How many of you have someone in your life that they only call when they need something? Anybody have that? Um, okay, a few of you. The rest of you, then, you are the person that calls only when you need something. <laughs> so, by the way, that's how you get, oh, no, then I'm not, that's how you get 100% participation in these things. Um, but here's what happens. Think about that. Now, that person is like the bane of your existence, like, oh, this guy again, you know. And, um, and so, but I want you to think about this. That person who only calls when they need something, there's usually a thread. There's a theme of what they're looking for. Now, if that person is not helpful to you in any way, they can be helpful to you in this. What are they asking for help with? What is it that they need? If you discover that, you'll probably discover, you'll be closer to discovering what your gifts and talents and calling may be. But God brings, what I love is that God then takes someone like Aaron, brings him into Moses' life to encourage him to say, listen, no amount of excuses is going to keep you from doing the thing that God has called you to do. So then we get to verse 18, and um, in the middle of this section that we're going to read is probably one of the strangest stories in the entire Bible, um, but we're going to talk about it. That's why we teach through the Bible, by the way. If I wasn't teaching through the Bible, there is a 100% chance that I would have skipped this story because it's so weird. And, um, but we teach through the Bible, so we even teach the weird stuff. And so anyway, but we acknowledge it as strange. Anyway, look at verse 18. It says, so Moses went, returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go, return to my brethren who are in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go, return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey. And he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. How there isn't a band called Rod of God. It just, it's just, I just feel like that's a missed opportunity. Anyway, back to the text. Uh, and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh that I put in your hand, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And it came to pass, here's where the weird part, he, it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses's feet and said, surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. And she said, you are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. Then we have a last little thing that's going to lead into chapter 5. And the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went, met him on the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. Aaron spoke the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. He did the signs in the sight of the people, so the people believed. And when they had heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he looked on their affliction, that he bowed, they bowed their heads and worshiped. Okay, last point, and then we're done. Um, we said this, that God, if he's preparing you, He's going to give you the tools to succeed. He's going to bring the right people. But here's the other thing, is that God will require walking in obedience as he prepares you. Now, like I said, we're going to read this. Verses 24, 25, 26 are some of the strangest in the entire Bible. Most Bible scholars agree that it is one of the hardest passages in the Bible to interpret. Um, because after finally getting Moses to go to Egypt, God tries to kill Moses. And then Moses' wife has this idea. I know what's going to solve this problem. She performs an impromptu circumcision. A foreskin gets thrown around, and then it ends. And it's like, that is so weird. 
It's so weird. And by the way, this is one of the ways you know that the Bible is not a purely man-made document because no one would add this story. It's too strange. I mean, could you imagine a committee? Like, how are we going to come up with how the children of Israel came out of Egypt? Like, what do you think? You know, we should have God call one guy. All right, that's good. Keep going. Calls one guy. Got it. But maybe that guy doesn't really want to go. Uh-huh. Okay, who else has got something? And, uh, but then he, God finally talks him into going, I like where you're going. Who else? And then another guy, he's like, what if when he's on his way, God tries to kill the guy? And then the wife takes a stone, cuts off a foreskin, and chucks it at him, and that's what solves it. And they're like, who let this guy in here? Get out! Get out! All right, other guys, come on, let's go. We've got to get serious. Like, right, nobody would come up with that. This is just too, the only The only possible explanation for this story is that it's so weird it actually happened. And, um, okay, so let's... Um, <laughs> So, okay, now, first thing you got to know, it says God tried to kill Moses. Now, the thing you got to understand is, um, as a general rule, if God wants you dead, the next thing happening will be your funeral, right? If God wants you dead, you're dead. That's just how it is, right? But it says that God tried to kill Moses. And by the way, some people are like, you mean God put a hit out on Moses? Like, no, God is not in the mafia. Um, but something happens Something happens that Moses is not doing well, and there is a recognition that this is from God for a particular reason. Now, there's a couple things that I want you to know. Okay, God calls Moses. Remember, he's, at, uh, he's in the Sinai Peninsula towards the bottom. At, at, he's at Mount Sinai, and he receives the call from God. After he says, okay, I'm going to go, remember, he's been with his, fa- his father-in-law's sheep, and he's got to go back. To Midian, which we talked about last time, was probably, he, it was about three weeks away where he was um, in the Sinai Peninsula. So he's got to go back to deliver his father-in-law's flock. So that's at least a three-week journey. He's got to get permission from his father-in-law to go. He's got to pack everything up. And as we saw in verse 20, he takes his wife and both of his sons, and they start out. They get to an encampment, and that's where this whole scene happens. So at least a month has gone by from the time he gets the call to this strange scene. Now, um, the thing that is interesting to me is that this Moses is going to die, and yet Zipporah, his wife, recognizes, and we don't know how, but she recognizes that the key to solving this problem is the circumcision of one of their kids. And that's what ends it. Now, why is this important? Uh, Circumcision was the sign that God, it was the sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham. It's where in Genesis 17, and God gives them the sign of this covenant that he says that God is going to multiply the people um, of Israel, and he's going to give them the land of Canaan as their possession. Once again, Moses is going to Egypt to get the people and take them to the land of promise. But look what it says uh, in Genesis 17, um, after God gives the promise. He says, and this uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now, no one knew this better than Moses because Moses was the writer of Genesis. Now, chapter two, when Moses leaves Egypt and gets to the land of Midian, um, he marries Zipporah and they have a son whose name is Gershom. Um, In Exodus 18, we will meet, uh, we'll get the name of his other son. And uh, it's in 2 Chronicles uh, 23 as well. Um, that his name of his other son is Eliezer. Now, this is important. Remember in verse 20, I said that Moses got his wife and his sons, plural. Um, but what I, it seems here is that Moses chose not to, even though it was the practice of the children of Israel, Moses chose not to circumcise um, one of his kids. That's why in verse 25, it says that Zipporah circumcises one. They took the child, circumcised him, and that's what ended it. So, um, my, what, what I contend, um, and once again, scholars are kind of all over the place. So I'm going to tell you, my, after my examination of this and reading, I don't know, I did probably a thousand pages of reading, maybe a little less, but um, on this topic uh, this week, is that Moses circumcised his older son, but not his younger son. This is why he only has to perform one circumcision for this whole thing, this whole si- situation to go away. We don't know why. However, you can't be the deliverer of Israel and not have being in basic obedience to 
um, what God has called you. I mean, your, your child, this, when, you were, when a child was circumcised, they were entering into the covenant that God made with Israel. You can't be the leader of Israel and saying, hey, God's going to fulfill his promise and his covenant when you haven't even, that hasn't even mattered to you in your own home. So he has to have his house in order. And the application, guys, for us is that we can't be leaders in the workplace or in the church if we aren't leaders and doing right in our home. But this is also, for Moses, a preview of coming attractions. And that is that blood will be the thing. That's what happens. Blood will be the thing that saves his life. That's why she says you are a husband of blood. Now, because in chapter 12, all of Israel is going to experience the same thing when the angel of death is unleashed all over Egypt, that there will be blood on the doorpost uh, so that the angel passes over uh, the house. Now, uh, Zipporah saying you are a husband of blood, the, the problem is we think it's like this very angry scene because we read it like Zipporah is like from the east end of London. Moses is my bloody husband, you know, or something like that. Um, and so, but that's not the case, right? And in that culture, and by the way, this is true in certain cultures now, on a couple's wedding night, the couple would produce a bloody sheet to show the virginity of the, blind, of the bride and the consummation of the relationship. That's what's being talked about here. Uh, Zipporah does the circumcision, places it at Moses' feet, and this whole situation ends, and she's like, it's okay, we're together, it's like our wedding night. Um, you are my husband by blood, and um, God has given you back to me. Um, and so, now, another issue I want to bring up before we close is that this is the sixth time that a woman has saved Moses in the first four chapters of Exodus. In chapter one, it was Shipra and Pua, the, the midwives that saved Moses at his birth. Uh, Moses' mother and sister in chapter two, as they put him in the little um, floating bassinet and put him in, in, the, in the, uh, the Nile. Then number five, Pharaoh's daughter finds him in the Nile. And then Miriam goes and gets us, um, his mom, Jacobed, to be uh, the wet nurse. And then finally, his wife here saves him. I want you to notice this. Do you see God elevating the importance of the role of women in the text? This is very important. This is why whenever you hear someone saying like, well, you know, the Bible is sexist, it subjugates women, it tells me that they have either never read the Bible or don't know how to read the Bible. Because throughout just four chapters, all, it's all we've gotten through in Exodus, God is elevating the role of women through this book. And by, so listen, the deliverer of Israel has been delivered six times so far by women. Finally, one final issue that is, is important for all of us, because we watch it and we're like, Moses, God is so clear in what he wants Moses to do. And even the, he's got to fix something in his personal life. He gets that fixed. And now let, what, what's he going to do? Um, but one of the questions that I get asked about the most is this idea of God's will. What is God's will for me? What does God want me to do? What do I do in this situation? How do I deal with this circumstance? So let me tell you something that has helped me greatly. And I've shared it with countless people over the years as they try to discern what God wants them to do. Um, it's, it's in the Gospel of John, and John records something that Jesus said. He said, anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or merely my own. Let me explain that. The people asking Jesus about his teaching, they're amazed by Jesus' words because they're so powerful. And Jesus says, hey, the teachings aren't mine. It's my Father who's giving me the words to speak. And he says, if anyone wants to do God's will, that is, you're doing God's will, you'll know whether my sayings are true or not. And in this, he is giving a secret to understanding what God wants us to do. That is this, if you will do what you know, then you'll know what to do. If you'll do what you know, then you'll know what to do. When I obey the commands of God that I already know to do, then the things that I don't understand become much clearer. Too often we get stuck on something where we don't know what to do and we stop doing everything that God wants us to do until we get an answer on that one thing. That is a bad strategy. Instead, what we want to do is keep walking in obedience to God in the things that we know God wants us to do. And as we walk in obedience, he will reveal the things that we don't understand. And listen, when you do that, God has a way of seeing that kind of faith and taking our obedience and multiplying it. So um, my son came to me a while back and, uh, and he said, there's a new game coming out for the Nintendo Switch. And I'm like, wow, thank you. Thank you for that information. I had no idea they were producing games anymore. No, I didn't say that. Uh, I said, okay. And he says, he says okay, Livy really wants this game that's coming out. So here's what I want to do. Can I give you the money for it? And then you order it for her. 
And I said, um, okay. And I said, is this a game you're interested in? He goes, I want the game too, but she really wants the game, so I want to get it for her. And I said, okay. Uh, so he's gonna, I'm like, don't give me the money yet. Let me just, let me look into it. So I, I go to my wife and I say, this kid, he could have just easily just bought this game for himself. And, um, but instead, he wants to buy the game for his sister instead. And I said, I'm just, I'm so moved by that. And so I go to GameStop the next day and I order two copies of the game, one for him and one for Livy. And, um, and then I'm like, yeah, hey, I want to order two copies. Like, oh, wow. And then they, then they told me the price of the games. And, uh, and I'm like, whoa, hey guys, I know your stock is doing pretty well, but maybe we throttle it back a little bit. And um, anyway, somewhere Dave Ramsey was crying and he didn't even know why um, as, as I'm paying for those two games. Anyway, so Carrie and I, we get it, we give it to the kids and they're over the moon. And I take Xander and I'm like, uh, I said, I just want you to know, I was so moved by that. I just wanted to reward your heart of generosity. Here's the point. When God sees an attitude of trust, he acts. When we do what we know and we decide, I don't know everything, but I do know what God wants me to do in these issues. I'm going to do what I know. Then here's what will happen. God is going to see that and bless, and then you'll know what to do. God has this way of revealing step two when we've been obedient with step one. So everything is ready now. The, the, begin, the introduction to Exodus is over. That Moses has God's call on his life. He's got his house in order. His brother is by his side and God is leading the way. And if you and I want to do something significant in our lives, then we need to follow this example. Discern the call of God on your life. Get your house in order. Have godly people by your side and follow the Lord as he leads the way. Let's pray together. And Lord, we want to thank you for that. That you want to reveal to us what you want us to do. So we pray. Uh, God, I pray for every person here that we would do what we know so that we would know what to do. And we look forward to all that you're going to do. We look forward to how you're going to reveal this to us. And God, give us courage to take steps forward even when we're not sure exactly where they lead. We're trusting you because we know that you're with us and we pray it in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus and begin a relationship with Him, congratulations. It's the best decision you're ever going to make. You may be wondering, so what happens now? Where do I go from here? Just text BEGIN to 62488 and we'll be able to send you this free gift. It's a book called BEGIN written by Pastor Bob and it's going to help you take those first steps on your new journey of faith. So remember, to stay up to date with everything happening at Calvary, follow at my Calvary on Instagram and Facebook. Till next week, we love you, we're praying for you, God bless you.